So I got this question from Neil Watson on one of my older videos where I show how I built the iron arch bridge. He says, the part where you gave the impression of an I-beam really interested me. He said it was easy to do but skipped over it. Would really welcome a tutorial on how to do that. Okay then Neil, let's hope that I can answer your question. Let's take a look at the girder that I used in that bridge. So you'll recognize this. It's used on the opening of these videos and it's also in a prominent position on the layout. You can see that it's got a 3D effect. So let's take a look at what makes up that 3D effect. If we zoom in, you see that this looks a little bit like an I-beam and these look like little raised, raised areas. If we deconstruct that, you'll see how I made it. So the first trick is to actually use real 3D. And by that, I mean, this is actually made up of three individual parts. If we, take them up, if we take them apart, you'll see what I mean. So each girder was built of three half millimeter pieces of card. So this was printed out, stuck to card, cut out, and then pasted on top of each other. So the bottom bit didn't really have anything, so we can disregard that. This next bit had those prominent 3D areas, but the bit that Neil's asking about is this bit, which made this look a little bit like an I-beam. Now this, at end scale, it's very, very small. If we measure the height of this, you see that's only three and a half millimeters. So it's very small. So you couldn't really get any more genuine 3D effect onto that without using 3D printing or some other kind of technique. So it's all into the printing to make it look as though it's 3D. So let's take a look at how I did that. If we're looking really, really close, You'll see it's just a set of lines. So we've got a dark line, a light line, a dark line, a light line, and a dark line. Slightly different widths. I think that was probably more accidental than on purpose. But the effect it gives is that nice 3D I beam kind of effect. So let's take a look at how to achieve that. It's very straightforward. The nice thing with working with textures is you don't always have to concentrate on getting textures of the right scale. This beam works perfectly at end scale, but when you have a look at the actual texture that it's using, it's using this enormous picture of a beam. The beam is almost 67 millimeters high, which would make it almost 10 meters in a scale end gauge. But we, it's just the rust that I was after. So I started with the texture. So I select the rectangle tool, and I was going to draw a beam of around about the same size as I used on the girder. I'm going to do this with a straight beam because it's easier to show what I did. So I'm going to make this beam three and a half millimeters high, same as the curved beam on the bridge. So we select the red beam, we hold down shift, and we select the green texture so that they're both selected. We right click, we click set clip, and there we have our rusty beam. I haven't managed to get it lined up with any good rusty patches. So I'm going to right click, release clip, drag it to somewhere a little bit more rusty and repeat the process. So there we go. So the beam looks a little bit rusty this time. So if we were just to print that out and use it on a bridge or a component, it looks a little bit flat. It doesn't have that nice 3D effect. And it certainly doesn't look like an eye beam. So how do we do that? And this is a really, really easy trick. If we take a normal rectangle and we'll make it a mid gray color. Now, the trick is to imagine that the light is coming from above. So if this was 3D, you'd have a little bit of light catching the top edge. So all we do is we take the pen tool with the snapping on. You'll see a little snap to the corner, handle to corner. We click once, we hold control down so that we're doing a horizontal line. And when it snaps to the other corner, we double click. So we put a line along the top. All we need to do is make that line, maybe make it a little bit thicker. It is, if we go to fill and stroke, and then stroke style, we'll see it's 0.265 millimeters for some reason. We'll make it 0.4 millimeters, make it a little bit wider. So let's select the line, hold down shift, and choose a lighter gray for it. Repeat the process at the bottom.
And already that's looking a little bit more 3D, or I think it certainly would if we made it full length and made those lines a little bit thicker. So the technique is simply that. We put a light line where the highlight is and a dark line where the low light is. So let's go to this. We need to make this look like an I-beam. And for that, we need to think about what shape an I-beam actually is. It looks something like this. If you imagine the light coming from the top, you'd get a highlight here and here, and you'd get a low light or a shadow here and here. So there's four lines we want to draw. We want to draw light, two light lines on the top bits, and two dark lines on the low bits. So let's go down to our girder that we were drawing. I'm going to zoom right in just to help me get it into the right place. So let's make this look a little bit 3D. I'm going to select the line tool and draw a line along the top. With that, I'm going to make it 0.3 of a millimetre wide. And if you notice, it's gone along the top. I'm just going to hold control down so it stays in the same place and just drag it down a little bit. I'm going to put it a little bit into the green like this, just to give it a bit of a background. I'm going to control D to duplicate it. I'm going to drag it to a similar place at the bottom. I'm going to control D again and move it up. And I think I will make it a little bit thinner. Um, so we'll make this 0.2 of a millimeter and we'll press control D and drag it to a similar place. We don't need to be exact. So those are our, our lines there. Now we want this one and this one to be light. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold down shift and make it white. I'm going to select this one, hold down shift and select that one and make it um, a slightly lighter gray. So something like that. Now we're almost there. What we'll do is we'll select the four of the lines. We'll drag that end out to there and this end all the way along to there. And that is now starting to look a little bit like an I-beam. Now one last trick you can do, rather than just having plain white, because obviously you'd, you'd, you'd want some of the rust to show through. If we select the white line, hold down shift and select that one. So on fill and stroke, you've got the blend mode of normal. What that does is just basically says, treat this as a normal color. There's lots of different things you can do, and I'm going to use this one here called Overlay. And what that does, it changes the way that the shape interacts with the colours underneath it. If we click Overlay, you'll see there that it makes it lighter whilst also maintaining some element of the colour. So some of the rust shows through. And if we scroll out now, that has a definite look of an I-beam to it. And once that's printed out and used on your components, it works really nicely. So there are other elements of the 3D effects that I've used, such as making these bars here 3D. I'm not going to go into those to answer this question, but if you are interested on how I do those, or you'd like more tutorials on how to do 3D effects with textures, please let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Here's a question from Peter. He says he's after a bit of help with importing textures to Inkscape. He joined up with textures.com and he's been downloading some textures, but so he says that some of them are too small, so he needs some help to join them. He's also interested in some weathering prior to printing. Now, Peter, I'll cover weathering in a future video, but for this one, let's have a look at using the textures from textures.com. There's a picture of my Weir pub, and there's a video on my channel about how I made that. The reason I put that picture there is we're going to use the frontage of the Weir as an example of how we use textures. So I've gone on and I've downloaded a texture from textures.com and it's really good because you can download their lowest quality textures for free. Um, but as you scroll down, you'll see that even their lowest quality are incredibly high quality considering the size that we need to use on our model railways. So obviously I model in N, but if we put that up there and then clip it to the front of my pub, you'll see that it's way, way too big. That just looks ridiculous. So what we need to do is we need to get that texture scaled down to N scale. Now, my second ever Inkscape video covered how I get them to the right scale. So I'm not going to go over that again. Let's concentrate on answering Peter's question. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller to start with, just to make it easier to work with. Now, when you're downloading a texture from textures.com, be sure to choose the seamless textures. 
What seamless means is that they join up side by side and top to bottom. So if we were to duplicate this texture and pop it there, you'll see that you can't really see the join. It all goes in together to make one seamless texture. If we duplicate these and drag those to there, they join up as well. So you see that you can build up a full-size wall by tiling the textures like this. So once you've done that, you could, of course, group them by selecting all four, right-click and clicking Group. Then you've got a group, so that's one element. You can then pop your shape on top and clip them. So that's one way of doing it, but I wouldn't recommend doing it that way. And I'll explain why. If we make this even smaller, let's make it more like what it would need to be for my chosen scale of N. I think it would look something more like that. You'd have to end up copying and pasting it lots of times. And then your file size could get bigger. Although if you watch my answer to question three, you'll see how I avoid that. But it's still a lot of work for no real benefit. So let's have a look at what else you can do. So we've got our building element that we want to fill. I've got the texture the right size. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the object menu, go down to pattern, and then click object to pattern. I've clicked that and nothing's happened. But behind the scenes, something very special has happened. So with the pub front selected, and that's one shape, it's very important that it's a single shape. So you'll see I can color it in. The windows and doors aren't white rectangles. They're actual holes in the shape. So watch my second Inkscape video again if you need to remember how to do that. So with the shape selected, I'm going to go to the Fill and Stroke palette. If the Fill and Stroke palette isn't open, you can go to Object, Fill and Stroke, and then it'll open for you. And we're going to go to the Fill part of it. Now the Fill part of it is where you can choose the colour that you want to fill your object in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the one, two, three, four, fifth element along, and that is a pattern fill. And I click that, and you'll see that automatically that is filled in with our bricks. And it's done that because it's called the pattern, pattern 991. There are various other patterns available. White stripes, black stripes, different shaped stripes, etc. But because we use object to pattern, pattern 991 is our bricks. So that's immediately filled it in with the bricks. But you'll notice a problem. Even though we scaled the bricks to the right size for our N-gauge building, it still brought the bricks onto the shape far too big. They are way, way too big for our N-scale. There's a way to fix that. Now, my version of Inkscape behaves a little bit strangely like this. And to be honest, I don't know whether it's a bug in Inkscape, whether it's meant to work like that, or whether it's just me. So what we do is, first of all, I'm going to click this button here. This is the Node tool, Edit Paths by Nodes. I'm going to press that, and this is the tool that you use if you want to change the shape of your shapes by dragging little nodes around. But I'm not going to do that. It also does something very special when you're working with patterns. But to see that, you've got to zoom right out. So holding down Control and wheeling the mouse, I'm continuing to wheel my mouse. And then somewhere, once you get zoomed right out, you'll see this little cross, circle, and square. This is really, really important. The first thing you need to do, though, is try and get hold of the little cross and drag it as close to your drawing as you can. Once you've done that, you can zoom all the way back in again. And it stays there, so you can move your cross. And what you do is you see, as you're moving the cross, the texture is moving behind the shape. So as I move it, the bricks move. The square, now hold down control when you're using the square to keep everything in proportion. Hold down control and move the square. And as you move the square, it gets closer to the cross. And as you can see, the texture gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So you get it to the size that you want. The circle, by the way, rotates it. Obviously, we don't want rotated bricks, so we'll leave them there. So that's about the right size, and that's all, it, that's all there is to it. Once you've done that, that prints out. That's an object in its own right. If you wanted to have another shape, let's say um, this star, 
and we want that filled in with our pattern, we can use the fill and stroke and choose our pattern. But you've noticed another problem here. Even though you went to all the trouble of getting this one scaled down to end scale, you've chosen to fill this one in with the pattern and it's gone in and it's massive size bricks again. So what I do whenever I'm starting a new building is I draw a massive rectangle bigger than the biggest element you're going to create for your layout. I fill that in, in the pattern. I use the node tool. I zoom right out until I find the little cross. Now it's down at the bottom for me today, but sometimes it's white up at the top as well. So you've got to zoom right out until you find it. I'm sure there's a reason for it putting it in a, in a weird place, but I haven't actually discovered what that reason is. So I zoom in, I then make it the right size. And like I said, if you follow my second Inkscape video, it shows you exactly how I get the bricks the right size. So let's, let's say that's the right size. What I then do is I keep that texture off to the side somewhere. Whenever I have a new shape that needs filling in, I simply go to the texture, control D to duplicate it, drag it down, move it to the back and clip it. So that's now clipped and it's the right size bricks for my end scale building. If I then wanted to do a star, filled in, in the right size bricks, my end scale building. I'd go back up there, select the texture, drag it down, move it to the back and clip it. And that way you've got this as the master. And then no matter how many objects you build up, build from it, the scale remains the same. You could even export this as an image and keep this as a large texture file, and then just treat that as a normal texture as you otherwise would. I hope that answered your question, Peter. I will show you a little bit of how I do weathering at the print stage in a future video. If you're enjoying this video or finding it useful, please press the thumbs up button. This encourages me to make more videos like this as I know that people are enjoying them. Okay, so here is a question from Liam at Deansbury Town Model Railway. He says, when using textures and then clipping to a shape, do you know how to effectively delete or crop away part of the original texture that is no longer required? The main reason is to reduce the file size. So this is a really good question, Liam, and there are a couple of answers. I think anyone who's used Inkscape with textures will have noticed that file sizes get very large very quickly. So I'm going to explain a little bit why that is, and then show you some things you can do while working with textures to keep your file size low. This makes it quicker to load files, quicker to save files, and it prevents Inkscape from slowing down when you use copy and paste and things like that within your drawings. So let's get started. So here is an empty Inkscape drawing. Our sample drawing is currently 1.53 kilobytes. So it's very small, as you'd expect, because it's empty. I've got a texture here, which is 371 kilobytes. So it's quite a small texture in itself, but it's bigger than the drawing file at the moment. Let's import that into Inkscape. So here we are with the texture in Inkscape. Let us just save the file straight away and see what's happened to it. So we can see that the file is now 502 kilobytes. So this is interesting, just as an aside, we dropped a 371k file into it and it went up by over 500k. That is just a side effect of how Inkscape stores images inside its files. It effectively divides them by six and multiplies them by eight, which ends up adding a third to the size of your files. So that is why your files actually seem to grow quicker than the textures that you're dropping in there. I won't go into any more detail of that because this is a model railway channel, not an IT channel. So with that texture in there, let's just say we want to use only a tiny little bit of it. Let's just say we want a circle of dirty blue concrete. So we'll draw the circle on top and clip the circle to that part of the image. So there's our dirty concrete circle and we can save that and have a look what's happened to the file size. So the file size has gone up by an extra kilobyte, just enough space to take the circle, but the size is still 504K. So the whole of that image is still in there. The reason being is that although we've clipped it to the circle, if we release the clip, the whole of the texture is still there. This enables us to move it around and reassign the clip if we wish. So the whole image is always in the file, like Liam says. Is there a way to remove it all? Yes, there is. And what we can do is we can do File, Export PNG Image, 
and that opens up the export PNG image panel over on the right. Now if we select the circle you'll see that this switches to selection. Leave most of it alone and just make sure that the DPI is at least 600. If you make it bigger the file size gets a lot higher and you won't notice any difference when you're printing it. So 600 is a good value for this. Click the export as button to choose where you're going to save your image and then just click the export button. Now you'll see that this has created a PNG image containing our texture and we can then import that back into Inkscape and you see here it's an image because it's PNG it's got transparent around so it's, it's still a circle. It's exactly the same shape and size as the original it's just that you can't unclip it so it's stuck like that now. So that is one way of getting rid of all of the extra bits of texture that you don't want Liam. However, it's worth bearing in mind that often the resulting file that you export is bigger than the file that you had in the first place. So you can see that the original texture was 371k, the drawing with it inside was 504k, the resulting PNG was 1190k. So in this case, I haven't achieved what you wanted, I've actually made the problem worse. Back in Inkscape, if we make the circle very, very small, because we're just printing out a very small component here, and then we go through the export process again, you'll see that this time the resulting PNG image is much, much smaller. So we've reduced it from 371K to 6K. So if you're working with small components, then this is definitely a technique you can use. But bear in mind that once you've done that, you can't alter this. So let's look at some other ways of working with textures in Inkscape. If we draw a couple of circles and save the file, the file is still 3K. It's actually gone up from just over 2 to 2.5. So these circles aren't taking up much space at all. The Inkscape file itself is just text that explains where the circles are and what colour they are. So no matter how big I make those circles or where I put them, they only take up a tiny piece of the file that Inkscape uses to save them. If we add the texture to the file, as you'd expect, the file size increases, so we're now on 504 kilobytes. And the reason for that is that the image is embedded in the file and it takes up a lot of space because it's a big image. Now you saw that when I had two circles in my drawing, the circle was in the file described twice. There was two circles in there. If I copy and paste this texture in my file and save it, the file size is now a megabyte. So it's doubled in size because we've doubled the images. When you're working with textures like this, you might be doing this. You might, you might have one circle with this texture on. This might not be a circle, obviously. It might be the gable end of a house or something like that. And you might duplicate it using Control D, like I always do. You might release the clip. You might change the texture around a little bit and then reapply it. So you've now got two shapes with the same texture and when you look at the size of that file it's one megabyte that is because you've duplicated the texture and the texture is stored in that file twice can we make this any better the answer is yes let's look at one way of keeping these file sizes down and i'm going to introduce the concept of cloning let's do a yellow circle again and then if you're using copy and paste so Control c Control v or if you're using duplicate Control d you've now got three circles Let's make this one red, let's make this one green, squash it and rotate it. So there's our three circles. However, there's another way you can do that. Here's a green circle and this time instead of copying, pasting or duplicating, I'm going to use Edit, Clone, Create Clone, which you can also use Alt D for. So let's create a clone and use Alt D to create another clone. I can make this one red. And if I make that one red, the other two go red as well. But let's make the original one a different shape. The others change shape. Let's rotate the original one. The others rotate. And they're rotating because these two are clones of this one. So whatever we do to this one is done to the other ones as well. So that's useful when it comes to working with textures. Here's the texture in our drawing. The file size is 503 kilobytes. Select the texture. Use Alt D to create a clone. Use Alt D again. Use Alt D again. Use Alt D again. So now I've got one, two, three, four, five of the texture in this file. Let's save the file. 
the size of the file has gone up by one kilobyte. This image is only in the file in one place and the rest are clones, so it's not saving it in different locations. Obviously, if we change the size of it, they all change because they're clones, but you wouldn't do that anyway. So Liam, the way that I work is I have one texture and I keep it off to the side. And if I'm working with shapes, so this might be the gable end of a building, for example, I will come to the texture, I'll press Alt D to clone it, move it to where I want and apply the clip. Then I'll do another one. Select the texture, Alt D, apply the clip, do another one, Alt D, apply the clip. And I work like that, and no matter how much I do with that, the file size remains constant. It doesn't get bigger very quickly. And that makes it very simple to save, copy and paste and open my files because they don't get absolutely massive. That's one technique. But what happens if you've got a lot of different textures to work with in one drawing? Your files can still get a little bit large. So this last tip works as long as you keep your textures and your Inkscape drawings on the same computer all the time. So let's have a look. I'm going to import this texture, which is 371 kilobytes. I'm going to do that by dragging it into Inkscape in the usual way. Now here at the import point, you might have noticed you get this image import type, embed or link. We've been using embed so far, which means we're inserting the texture into the Inkscape file. If we click link, however, the texture comes in. And if we save this file, the file is only four kilobytes. It hasn't gone up to 500 like it did last time. Come back here, we can use normal duplicate. So these aren't clones, these are just normal duplicates of each other. No matter how many we put in and we save the file, that file is now only seven kilobytes. It's absolutely tiny. Why is that? Because we chose link rather than embed, all that Inkscape is saving in its own file is a reference to where that texture is on my computer. It is telling Inkscape I want a texture, don't import the texture, just use the texture from the computer. Now this works really well for me. I simply keep all my textures in a folder that never changes and I just link them. That way, all of my Inkscape files are as small as they possibly can be. This works well when clipping. There's our texture and the file is tiny. So that is actually the best way of working, Liam, because you don't lose any quality like that and you keep your files to an absolute minimum. One thing you do need to be careful of, though, when working in this way is if you accidentally delete the texture or move it to a different part of your computer, then your image in Inkscape breaks. And if we release the clip, you'll see here that you get this big linked image not found um, box and it can be difficult to fix. So that's just something to watch out on that. So Liam, there's a couple of options to keep your file sizes down. I hope that answered your questions. If you've got any more, please let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. I hope you found these three answers useful or enjoyable. If you did find them of use, please press the thumbs up button. This will encourage me to make more videos like this in future. You might also want to subscribe and watch the continued evolution of my Engage city-based viaduct layout. Until next time, thank you for watching and I'll see you later.